had to read it, Mike. <laughs> because you came to an order so quickly. I never had a class come to order. <laughs> My name is Dominic Aquila, and I'm the Provost and Academic Vice President of the University of St. Thomas. Uh, and I am deeply honored this evening to have uh, a very distinguished panel to speak about uh, Father Corona, a special guest who joins us all the way uh, from Milan to speak about his new book on disarming beauty. And so we will have a very, as always, a very lively conversation. The University of St. Thomas has been working with Crossroads Cultural Center uh, now for more than eight years. And we've put on a number of programs here at the university across a wide variety of fields that deals with culture in all its variety, in science, the arts, literature, philosophy, theology. And so tonight, we're very honored to continue that tradition with our very special guest and honored guest, uh, Father Corona. I was reminded as I read through uh, Father Corona's book and what he's trying to achieve uh, in that book in coming into dialogue with others in the public square especially in the American context right now, to be able to bring religion at all, not just to say Christianity, into dialogue with others in the public sphere has been a considerable challenge. And I was talking with Father Corona a little earlier about the work of Bishop Robert Barrett. And many of you might know uh, Bishop Barron's ministry, Word on Fire. And I found as I was reading Father Caron's book and following Bishop Barron recently, is that you may know that just a few weeks ago, Bishop Barron was invited to speak at Facebook. Not, not speak on Facebook, but he actually <laughs> went to the corporate headquarters of Facebook to give a lecture because Facebook and Google, they routinely have these kinds of uh, speakers come and speak to the employees there. And the topic that Father, uh, that Bishop Barron spoke about was very much along the same lines as we <coughs> find in Father Caron's book, is that how do you have a religious dialogue in our culture? What is the way to have that conversation? Because the experience is, either you're not allowed to speak, you know, religion is so privatized that you can't speak, or when you do get to speak, it's really verbal bludgeoning and not argument in the classic sense of how to listen intently to someone else, how to make a proposal, and respectfully converse about that proposal. Okay, no. Maybe that, that works. <laughs> well, well, where was I? Okay. So, uh, this whole um, idea about how do we speak about the ultimate things in life uh, in the public sphere, I think that is a crucial question for our time, irrespective of its content. But how do you have this dialogue? And then the dialogue itself brings very unexpected fruits. You never know what you can learn. And that's the whole idea of classical argument, is when you enter into a discussion, not for the purpose of bludgeoning your opponent into your opinion, but rather to learn and to exchange ideas and to make proposals that are meaningful. And so, this evening we're very honored to have this panel here, and I'm going to turn it over to Father Jose, who will introduce each member of the panel. Uh, but I'm, you're very much uh, in for a great discussion tonight, something very timely for our times. And uh, if this is your first visit to the University of St. Thomas, I give you a hearty welcome. And I would introduce Father Jose.
Thank you very much for your hospitality, for having us. Uh, I have a very simple job today, although I don't think I can stop myself from reminding, I don't know, when you were young, there was a joke, there is an Irish and Spaniard and American walk into a bar. That's in a sense how I feel a little bit with the panel we have tonight. <laughs> we have a lot of variety, a very eclectic group of people who, as Dominic Aquila was just saying, um, gather together to dialogue. There is a lot of um, conversation about how to dialogue and how to arrive to it, as you were reminding us. Um, and, and tonight's attempt is a simple one, is to have one. And uh, the opportunity uh, for this dialogue is, is the publication of Father Caron's book, The Sunny Beauty. And uh, very mindful of the author's intention, we are not here so much to present the book, but to dialogue about it, starting from it. Uh, in particular, this evening, we ask our panelists not only to give us their remarks, and their brief remarks, and their impressions, but also to engage in the opportunity to ask questions to the author, which makes my job a lot easier. I just have to sit and watch. Uh, I wanted to introduce you briefly who we have with us tonight. Uh, on my right, I have Father Julian Caron. Uh, Marlon Hall is sitting next to him. He's an anthropologist and entrepreneur. And I will not read much of your biography, but it is quite amusing. And, uh, <laughs> I totally agree. Uh, and as you told me before, your mother agrees too. <laughs> uh, Dr. Ferrari is, is next to us. He is the CEO of uh, the Methodist Hospital Research Institute. And to my left is Lois Marcos, professor of English at the, uh, and Humanities at the Houston Baptist University. Our fourth speaker is MJ Ken. He will join us when uh, he arrives. Um, and I will introduce him later when he is here with us. To begin, we ask, uh, we ask Marlon to introduce us into the conversation. So we are ready for you, Marlon. Awesome. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Marlon Hall, and uh, this book, in many ways, uh, has given me language more tangible than thought, in that it has been uniquely art and power and possibility. And I want to read um, a quote that, in many ways, speaks to that truth. Nothing is as fascinating as the discovery of the real dimensions of one's own eye. Nothing so rich in surprises as the discovery of one's own human face. This is a thrilling adventure, but to set out on this adventure and vanquish our extraneousness from ourselves, we need someone to look at. Look at our humanity with us. Someone who does not balk at it, or balk about it. And this is our work. Um, I am a filmmaker, I'm an anthropologist, and my goal is to try to work with God to provide a mirror for people to see their most beautiful selves through their own brokenness. Uh, our films grow from brokenness to beauty. And we are more so spiritual archaeologists than we are uh, visual anthropologists in that we work with people to unearth what's beautiful in what's broken in their story, including our own mayor. Would you, would you roll, roll that tape for us? Thank you. My dad was diagnosed with cancer, but um, the kids, we didn't know that he was suffering with cancer. And so uh, when he was out there, we were out there cutting people's yard, we would see my dad um, fall to the ground and grab a lot more and pull himself back up. Quite frankly, when we back then, we just thought my whole man was, you know, you know, just getting old and falling. One of the things that I learned from my dad in his living and in his dying that I didn't get from Klein or University of Houston or Harvard is that uh, when life knocks you down, you have to learn how to pull yourself right back up. 
So our work is to, is to do exactly that, to, to walk with people as they discover their own humanity through, through broken stories. And so the, the intention of Folklore Films is threefold. Number one, we want everyone to know that we are all folkloric. No matter who you are, if your heart beats in rhythm with the flow of your blood, you have a folkloric contribution to make. And you can make an indelible mark on humanity that no one can erase. And if you don't make that mark, that mark won't be made. We are all folkloric. The second intention is to celebrate our humanity. So uh, the film series does not celebrate people as celebrities, but we invite people to talk about their most broken stories and the beauty that's come of it. I'll conclude with, with a story about one of our subjects. In fact, we, we, we invite people to be as vulnerable as possible, even at the risk of jeopardizing their possibility or their positions in life. Uh, Mayor Anise Parker. Anybody remember Mayor Anise Parker? Of course you do. She was, oh, you don't remember Mayor Anise Parker. <laughs> she was a significant contribution to city and civic leadership. And she is a poet. We did her film, and when we screened her film, it just so happened to be the week that she had sequestered a bunch of religious sermons from people, people who were bashing the queer community. And so she was religiously exhausted when she walked through the doors of our film company to screen her film. We screened her film, and at the end of her film, she was slumped over, and I thought that she had gone to sleep on my film, y'all. I was a little upset. <laughs> a little upset. But I looked between her heels, Father, and I saw that there was a, a puddle of tears there. And the mayor stood up at the end of us screening her film, and she said, I'm the mayor, and I can do what I want. She said, and I would like to read a poem. You see, our poems are visual poetry. They don't move like a narrative driven by chronology. They move with the heartbeat of the subject. And we did her visual poem that way. She said, I want to share a poem with you. And from memory, y'all, y'all, Father, that's, that's rural Houston. It was inaccurate. We get for careful. From memory, y'all, she shared a 16 stanza poem about the relationship that she was having with her parents. They had given her everything, and she was taking everything from them because they were older and they could no longer drive, could no, no longer live alone. After she shared this story in poetry, as my great grandmother used to say, used to say you, you could hear a rat peeing on a cotton ball. It was so quiet. It was quiet. And she said, I'm done. And the applause that came as a result of the leader of our city deciding to be vulnerable to expose what was broken but also at the same time what was beautiful transformed what it meant in the room to be human. And so we provide a space where people can see themselves through their brokenness as beautiful, as human. We work to create a disarming beauty, one folkloric film at a time. over here at Houston Baptist University for 26 years. And um, one of the specialties I have at HBU is the writings of C.S. Lewis. And when I read Disarming Beauty, I would have liked it in any case, uh, but he does quote Lewis and he pulls out an aspect of Lewis that I think is very, very helpful for our modern society. Uh, if you don't know Lewis, he's what's called a Christian apologist. He's someone that offers a logical, rational defense of the Christian faith. But even though a lot of Lewis's arguments are reason-based and logic-based, he also made other arguments that I think may speak to our age even more powerfully. And one of his arguments is actually based on yearning and desire. And I see this as well in Father Perone's book, that all of us have this innate yearning or desire for things that are supernatural, above nature, or <coughs> metaphysical, beyond the physical. And it can be set off by anything. For Lewis, 
Uh, when he was young, he had a toothache, and his brother made a little toy garden on a biscuit tin. Looking at that, or looking at a picture in a Beatrix Potter book, or reading a few lines of poetry about the Norse god Balder, they were all random things, but somehow when Lewis encountered them, they sort of opened up a window on a deeper, richer reality. The young boy was suddenly transported, carried away to some place beyond our physical, spatial, temporal <coughs> world. A window opened up. And Lewis argued that all of us have those moments. They could be set off by something in nature. They could be set off by a beautiful song, by looking at a work of art in a gallery. It could be the seemingly most mundane thing, but it suddenly sets off this intense yearning or desire for something transcendent, something beyond. And Lewis used that communal experience as an argument in favor of the spiritual realm and of God in a very similar way to disarming beauty. This is the way he explains it. The fact that we get hungry proves, or at least strongly suggests, that we are creatures made for eating. The fact that we get thirsty certainly seems to prove that we are creatures made for drinking. Unless you're a Southern Baptist like me. Now, <laughs> the fact that we get hungry and thirsty, that in and of itself doesn't prove we're going to get those things. If I'm in the middle of the desert, I'm going to die for lack of water. But the yearning, the desire for drink, suggests that I was made to be filled by liquid. Right? In the same way, just because a boy falls in love with a girl, it doesn't mean he's going to get her as his wife. But, Lewis says, it would be a strange thing indeed if that experience we call falling in love took place in a sexless world. Well, the fact that we all desire things that our physical, natural world cannot supply, that seems to prove that there is another reality that is the source of our yearning. If all there is is nature, if all there is is the physical, natural, material world, where did that yearning come from? How could nature produce in us a yearning for something nature knows nothing about? Let me say this one more way and then I'll stop here. Another way of saying it is, how do we know that as creatures we were meant for eternity? That there's an aspect of us that we call the soul that is not meant just for time, but is meant for eternity. And Lewis says, and I kept hearing this echo as I read Disarming Beauty, you notice how people, all of us, are continually surprised by the passage of time. We see somebody we haven't seen in a few years and we say, my, how you've grown, as if they were going to stay the same forever. Right? Sometimes I pull in to the parking lot. The, the only uh, perk that we get as teachers is we can park a little bit closer. And every so often, I park and I get out and I think, what if a policeman sees me and thinks I'm a student? Right, that's going to happen. <laughs> it, it, it's not vanity doing this. None of us, right? Those of you that are my age or older, you probably think it was all a dream. I had children, they grew up, I had great. It doesn't make sense. We, we, we cannot shake this belief that time should not control us. Now, folks, this is a strange thing. I want you to think about this. The fact that we are continually surprised by the passage of time, that's as if a fish were to be continually surprised by the wetness of water. Right? All that we've ever known in our lives is past future. All that a fish has ever known is water. It should not seem strange to us. And yet, somehow, we are never quite comfortable in time. Listen here. It would be a strange thing, Lewis says, if a fish were to be continually surprised by the wetness of water, unless that fish were destined someday 
to be a land animal. We were not meant for time. And that's why we're never quite comfortable. Like Father Crone, I work with young people in my life. And I see in them that yearning, that desire for transcendence. But our world doesn't let you do that. Our world says, nope, everything's a closed system. There's nothing out there. That's just superstition. That's just like, wish fulfillment, as Freud would say. But yet they can't shake it. They yearn for it. <coughs> what happens after a while is they give up. They give up their divine discontent and they settle for this world. As T.S. Eliot said in the Four Quartets, we are distracted from distraction by distraction. Why are they always on their phones? Why are they always doing those kind of things? It's because you get so sad about not being able to find an answer to your yearning for transcendence that you just give up and you let your life be, you know, covered for you by media and things. And I think this is the same thing that Father Perone is pointing to his book. He's finding it in European students. I'm seeing it in American students as well. A yearning that is not fulfilled and it makes us give up and we give in to the malaise that you talk about in your book. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> we work on MJ Khan with us. Thank you very much for coming. MJ Khan is the, is the president of the Islamic Society of Greater Houston. And we will get to you in a second. We are going to give you some time to read. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. And now we are going to go with Marco Ferrari. From the arts to the sciences. About a year ago, a doctor from California started writing a physician. And the reason why he was writing to me is because his wife, a young lady, had a special type of cancer that I've been working with that is currently incurable, intractable, so destined to die. The gentleman was reaching out for help because we had a new drug that may actually be helpful in the future. And initially, the back and forth was initially more technical, patient doctor, friendly, but you know. And then little by little, was getting closer and closer to sharing our emotions and sharing, of course, in this tragedy that this family was living. And uh, at a certain point, uh, a couple of weeks ago, he slipped in his communication to me the word blessings. And that opened an entire new vision and perspective on the relationship. And we started speaking, bringing in writing to each other, bringing in spiritual element, talking about God. And then he wrote me a letter that said, uh, it is the last time I'm going to ask you if the drug is now available, because she's not going to make it much longer. Is there anything that you can do? And the answer was, of course, not. In California, they were doing everything. It's a fantastic institution that she was at. But we shared, and then you wrote back to me that she had passed. And with her passing, we shared prayers and wishes in a way that was so much deeper than the relation that had been up to that point, to a very intimate point of sharing. And by the way he was writing and some of his words, it became clear to me and his last name, perhaps, that he was of Islamic faith. And I bet he knew all along that I'm Catholic or something like that by my last name, right? <laughs> and that never made an iota of a difference in the way we were speaking about God. So we were talking about, we were speaking the same way, using the same words, making reference to the same human experience, not an iota of a difference. 
And the reason why we were so close together, it was because we were brought together by experience, not by reason and theological frameworks, and all of these other things that are very, very important as well, but were brought together by experience. And so, Father Caron, I was reminded, I was reminded of the passage that you have in the 8th chapter, I believe, of your book, when you speak about the great French philosopher, Roland Barthes, and how he speaks about being modern, meaning that the reason is completely separated from experience until his mother dies. And with his mother dying, he looks back at all of his intellectual constructs that he has created and says, I don't care about this anymore. I care about my inclinations. I care about my desires. I care about human spirit. I would presume that it goes hand in hand. But he cares about that as the experience brings you together, brings you closer to your soul, to your heart, and brings you closer to God. So, last week, sorry if I get up, I can't, no, I get easy yes. to. <laughs> Did I have to do it again? No. <laughs> no, please, he said, no, please. <laughs> so, the, um, so last week, I had the privilege for the first time in participating in the works of the Pontifical Academy for Life in the Vatican. And I had the opportunity to participate in this for a couple of days. And Pope Francis was there. And he shared his vision and he gave his speech. And he presented his perspective and his mandate to the Pontifical Academy. So I'm thinking, just on Saturday, I'm there with the Pope, and this right now I'm here with you, and with you all. Of course, don't take any offense. I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking I may have died and gone to the good place and nobody told me. <laughs> but then I look around, again, no offense for anybody. I look around with the type of life I lead, with all of these terminal patients that I see, because my work is essentially with terminal patients. That's what happens if you are the head of the research institute, right? And I see, I'm going to ask you a question, I'm going to go out of order, I hope it's okay. I need to ask a question. Because of course all of the pain and the death that I see around me, that I experience every day, is in growing <coughs> burden, incredible burden and tragedy. There are more stories than one can tell. And it's so difficult to reconcile, of course. You know, with faith, with joy, with uh, disarming beauty. Other than, I realized that my connection with this doctor could not have been as deep unless we had gone through the painful experience. He went through a painful experience and I tried to help. So there is this moment when one thinks the pain and horror and death that they are part of the great design in ways that perhaps we cannot comprehend. Them. But it is so difficult to make peace with those. It's so difficult to make peace with those. So as I go through your book, and here's my question, I'm looking for ways, for ways to help reconcile that. I need that, that's the, to stand up and do what I do. It is so difficult to do that, and I'm looking and the categories, of course, of education, so wonderfully spoken. And the category of experience has been the inspiration for everything we do, even though with the changes in science and technology, this day and age, we can read the thoughts, we can make experiences happen in somebody's said <coughs> that have never happened, and there is so much that we can talk about that. That was one of the themes of the Pontifical Academy. So my question for you, I have another one later if I'm allowed. <laughs> <laughs> but my question for you is, can you help me through the perspective that you're bringing forth with this wonderful book? Can you help me with peace, make peace with pain and death and evil in others? Thank you. Thank you. Give us uh, your thoughts. <clears throat> Good evening. 
uh, Father Kayon, welcome to Houston. It's an honor to, to be with you. Uh, uh, this day and age, uh, sometimes we get confused when we see what's going on all around us. Uh, I must admit and apologize for being late. My boss called around 4 o'clock. Her car was having trouble and I had to go and exchange the car with her. And I was uh, relying on faith to be here on time. <laughs> uh, but we have to accept uh, the God's will. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think the topics which you addressed are the topics which really the whole society must be pondering upon. Because the way, you know, you one would expect that in 21st century, the human beings have developed to a point where some of the issues which you face on a daily basis would not be there. Like discrimination, like hatred, like uh, divide, just because we are different, you know, uh, and lack of communication. But it seems to me that uh, human beings have not really changed over the centuries, over the millennia. We still have that, uh, those animal instinct. And, uh, you know, I always ponder upon what makes us different as a, as a superior uh, creations of Lord Almighty. So we believe that man and woman and in between, we are the best of Lord's creation. What differentiates us from animals or Satan as people of faith believe and angels? Man have the capacity to be angel-like and man have the capacity to be worse than Satan in some sense. We yeah, have seen examples after examples. And the items, the thing, topics which you touched, the cultural divide, why is it that we don't appreciate that just because somebody has a different background or culture, that it's not as beautiful as they believe my culture would be? Uh, I think that uh, people and professors have, have uh, written a lot in, in, in this area about uh, uh, the downward spiral of the family life in, in many of the places around the world, especially in the West, the lack of faith. Uh, people are beginning to uh, somehow think that uh, faith is uh, something which is uh, not affecting our daily lives or cannot affect our daily lives. And the, just uh, you know, completion of being, you know, the best you can be and it's a me, me, me generation, you know, that's what. So I think the topics which you have covered, I think those are what I would say that those topics must be uh, addressed at a societal level, at all levels, and not just an intellectual group like this, but uh, uh, at every level where people are struggling with these things. And I think that uh, uh, probably, in my opinion, uh, you know, uh, this is a question I would ask you, that uh, by giving up reliance on faith, have we really gone to the, to that side where our animal instincts are taking over rather than angelical uh, capacity which we have. But uh, hopefully we will have some of these points. Thank you. I'm going to begin by very simply bringing all of these. There is one thing that is very striking, uh, and I'm going to do as Mauro Ferrari said. I'm going to also skip um, because I I told them that I was going to ask them a question, but I really want to ask the question to Father Puriyan because it is striking to me that four people from very diverse backgrounds read this book and highlight these 
this um, almost paradoxical nature of our being, starting from experience. You know, we are not philosophizing. We are speaking about brokenness. We are speaking about um, pain. And at the same time, we are speaking about yearning. We are speaking about angelical life. And in a sense, we have, it's like it, it feels we have this question of how is this coming together? How is this? Because I think it's also interesting in what, in what Marlon uh, was saying before, how this is so much related to the, the awakening of the eye. And that an event seems to actually almost bring in a mystical embrace this brokenness and this yearning. So I, I, I reformulate the question that, that uh, Mauro was asking. So like how to stay in front of the greatness of our desire when, when it is so deeply embraced in our experience to the brokenness that we see. Good evening, everybody. I am very happy to, to share this moment of dialogue uh, about most, more important things in life. Because uh, all these uh, issues that uh, we have listened to now uh, are part of our life, make uh, life dramatic. Um, and this uh, allows to to introduce ourselves in the mystery of our eye, not like a intellectual realm, no, but from experience, and is a calm of everybody because everybody uh, has the journey, the desire. Everybody can have this experience of brokenness in our model, or the pain, or, or the others, uh, different. So we are always dealing in some way or another with, uh, with this kind of issues that uh, we can say break our measure, mm -hmm. the measure of our reason. Mm -hmm. Because reason, as we usually use, is only the measure through which we can understand what life is about. But Reason is constantly uh, broken. No? We can say uh, the events are constantly force the measure that we are trying to use to understand things, mm -hmm. to understand life. No? And as Shakespeare said, there are more reality on heaven and on earth that are in our philosophy, in our way of thinking. And this is part of the battle that we are always taking. <coughs> no? uh, what is the way of understanding this kind of things? Because if we are using reason as a measure, there is a lot of things in life that are uncomprehensible, without meaning, are absolutely, absolutely meaningless. And we are in front of, the, of these issues uh, in every moment. So, and we have to decide. If the only way of understanding this kind of issue is reason according to the pattern of this rationalistic way of thinking, of reality, like a measure, we have to recognize 
that it's impossible for us to understand. And it's difficult to reveal a person who, after uh, the experience of brokenness, it's difficult to answer to all the yearning of the thirst that we are inside of or the, the urgency of a meaning for pain. It's difficult, it's impossible. No? And so we need to, to, decide, to, to decide if we use only reason in such a way of reason is the possibility, is the window that uh, allows us to, to see more than only our vision. Because uh, what is at stake is only this. And experience, uh, first of all, uh, our friend said, is uh, what always uh, make broader. Because otherwise, it is, uh, there is a lot of things that they have no room in the way we are thinking our vision. And this is, for many people, is something uh, like an obstacle or a disgrace or something, uh, a misfortune. But I think that is the contrary is the possibility of recognizing what is our greatness. For our poet, the Italian poet Leopardi, uh, the recognition that everything that we can see in the universe, in the immense universe, is so tiny to answer to our desire and to accuse everything of insufficient is, according to him, the, great, the, the, the most important sign of the greatness of human being. Mm. Mm. So, for many people it's a disgrace. For some people it's the way if we can recognize our dignity, <coughs> our dignity, that we are not only uh, somebody reduced to some kind of elements or uh, and biological, biological, or sociological, or psychological antecedents or requisite for our life, but we are greater than we are. And so we have a possibility of entering into the relationship with the mystery. Mm -hmm. All reality is pushing to something else. Yeah. In all the experience, the human experience we are talking about, can be pain, more dramatic thing, but it can be something so beautiful as design that is always pushing without uh, rest inside of us because we can cannot be accounted with what we have uh, got. Um, the possibility of recognizing that something is broken mm. is because we have the possibility of, of judging that something is broken because we have something else that is not broken. <laughs> so, this is what we need to, to decide. Reality is only what enters in our measure 
or reality is this openness that introduces us to the mystery of reality. And so, in such a way, we can see that brokenness can be a grace instead of a failure. And that a failure can be the possibility of a new, new, a new knowledge about, our, about ourselves. And recognizing that we are made for something else mm -hmm. that is beyond what we can get. And that pain is a possibility no, to recognize that we are not able to give us a meaning by ourselves. And we need to be open to the mystery. Or that desire uh, is pushing from the set of to something that is beyond. So, we are touching in our experiences the mystery of our eye, of our own passion. And the question is, if we accept where the experience is bringing us, is bringing us, or we, in a moment, we, we are pushing beyond, we are so perplexed, no? in front of this, no? we are so lost in the middle of nowhere that we, no, it's not possible. But possibility is the only way of safe reason. Because reason is the category of the possibility. Always there is more reality in heaven and on earth than there was in the So if we want to understand we need to start a deep revision of the concept of reason. Because in our time, reason and mystery are not possible to be reconciled. If we have to speak about reason, we are excluded mystery. But only a reason who opened the mystery can be human mm -hmm. And in such a way, we can accept pain. Mm -hmm. Or we can understand that pain is the possibility of entering in the relationship with the mystery. As a possibility of discovering the meaning of this mystery, the meaning of the effect. Because we are made for something else beyond our possibilities of fulfillment. And only if we accept to be, to be take, taken to this point, we can recognize what is the mystery. And this is what everybody has to decide. Because religiosity is not something that happens when we are uh, in a particular mystic moment. Religiosity is this way of living reality with such as, such as openness. Mm -hmm. no? And everything that happen in our life can be not against that, but a possibility of open ourselves to this mystery. Mm -hmm. And if I have the possibility of uh, adding something else, if this mystery, according to Christian faith, has become mine, have, en have entered in history, 
um, have um, share the pain up to the cross. <coughs> I have entered in the mystery of the brokenness. I have answered to the desire, to the thirst of the Samaritan woman. The only possibility to, to save the desire is somebody who has an answer to it. The only possibility of a meaning for pain is somebody who has entered into the, the depth of this pain, sharing this pain up to the, up to the end, um, feeling this pain, this darkness of the meaning of the life of the resurrection. Without this, there is no possibility of answer to the problem. But there is somebody who has shared with us all this brokenness up to the end to feel everything with me. And this is what we are talking about in this book. They don't need any other beauty, any other power to impose beauty than to offer to everybody in his brokenness, in his pain, in his thirst, in his desire the possibility of fulfillment. Sometimes it's painful not to be uh, able to have, to find something that can answer our desire or the meaning of the pain or answer to problems. But we are always before this possibility when the mystery has become part of the history, has offered the promise that this another possibility beyond our measure, that this some event that we can look before us and recognize in the in its capacity of giving meaning to these particular uh, dramatic experiences. And this is the verification of faith that we can do. Mm -hmm. now, if we are open to verify if this would be a promise instead of a blessing, that I said before, a blessing in a time, uh, course, for every one of us. You. Any comments or questions from a panelist? Can we give him a round of applause first? <laughs>
thinking about God like uh, somebody who is spared of all our difficulties in life. Mm -hmm. no? mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, once that I take a class in Milan. That's and painful. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the taxi was a theologian, uh, we can say, because he, he was uh, reading a book of an uh, theolo Italian theologian. And we were talking about everything. In a moment, uh, he started to blame uh, God for uh, what he allowed to happen in the world. And he started to, to, to blame God on a terrible level. And I, instead of stopping him, I encouraged him, offering him something. <laughs> and, when, and when he uh, uh, was uh, full of this argument, uh, I asked him, can I have a question for you? Uh, yes, you can ask me the question. Um, do you think, do you prefer to have um, some, that your wife uh, love you mechanically because it's the only possibility and that they, she cannot be unfaithful to you? Because there is no risk. <coughs> there is some mechanical way of love. There is no risk. Or you could you or would you prefer to be loved by somebody free? He didn't love not even accept. I prefer to be loved free. It was the game was made because it was only the question I put in before you. I do you think that the mystery has less uh, uh, gusto, less light than you are? He preferred somebody who loved him freely, not somebody who loved him because he don't have another position. <coughs> so, it's true. This is what depends on God. Pain or brokenness is part of life. The question is, in this possibility, in this occasion, these opportunities are used for a relationship, no? Uh, all these are always an occasion of blaming the Creator because we are free people. Because freedom is a gift. It's the best gift that we have received. He has no problem to create another star that make the orbit perfect or another uh, kind of animal who can follow the Eastern system without broken it. 